One night in May in 1895 in Savan, India, Jiddu Krishnamurti came into the world. In the Indian dating system, the day starts at dawn, so Krishnamurti was born on the 11th of May, but in the West it would have been the 12th of May. As a young lad, he was recognised by C. W. Ledbetter and Annie Besant to be the body that they were looking for, the body that could become the vehicle for the world teacher that they wanted to send out into the world. This world teacher would have to be trained to be able to take on both the Christ and the Buddhist Maitreya impulses. So this world teacher would be coming from the Christian stream and also the Buddhic stream, which Rudolf Steiner says is not possible, for they are two different streams. But Krishnamurti took on this role and trained in it and learnt from Annie Besant and C.W. Leadbeater how to develop himself. So he took this role on from an early years, but in his twenties he took a step back from the society that had made him into this world leader. Being a world teacher was a role he never gave up, as he states, I'm, I am a teacher and I go about the world. But he wasn't teaching as a world teacher as in the way that Annie Besant and Ledbetter wanted to teach him. What he did was turn away from the idea of the world teacher that Besant and Ledbetter envisaged. He did not want to be overshadowed by the Christ and Maitreya. This has been discussed in many biographies about the initiation processes he went through and some of them were very painful physically as well as mentally. And this would have changed a man, any person that went through these trainings that these theosophists put him through. And I'm not poo-pooing theosophy here, but maybe they were not aware of what it is that makes a world teacher and that a world teacher is not compliant to anybody. I often refer to this as Krishnamurti's Brian moment, for those of you that have seen the life of Brian. You know, he was not the teacher. I am not the Messiah, is more or less what he was saying. But he was a teacher, as he says, and he does, did go about the world, passing on the teachings that he knew. He wanted to help people. He was aware that people were following him for help, spiritual help. But many of them seemed to just want to follow a leader rather than walk the spiritual path themselves, which is something that Krishnamurti was very adamant on putting across to people. You can come and listen, you can come and learn from these people, but you must blaze your own path, as I often say to people. You must walk the walk. And I've noticed many teachers may talk the talk, but they don't necessarily walk the walk. I personally think Krishnamurti walk the walk as well as talk the talk. And I'm going to give you a quote here from Krishnamurti. And he says, What is the kingdom of happiness? I do not want you to obey blindly or listen without thought. I invite you to my window and I ask you to quit your small opening, to come and look for a bigger opening at a beautiful view. It is not a kingdom that lies far off, nor an abode for which we need make a voyage to the ends of the earth. You must find the keys that opens all the gates of heaven, and that key is your inner voice. If that voice is the only tyrant you obey, then that kingdom of happiness is within the reach of every one of you. Now this quote is from the speech he gave when he dissolved the Order of the Star, and the Order of the Star was the organisation created to aid him become the world teacher, it was helping him with his role. So why did Krishnamurti do this, turn down the role that he'd been prepared for? And again, there are countless books and articles about this and how Krishnamurti, he became the world teacher and how he then turned down the role of being the world teacher. What I'm doing with this little show is asking people, is this something that anybody can attain to? Can anybody become a world teacher? Can anybody find the divine in within themselves, which is something that I very strongly believe in. Now, as I said at the beginning, the Theosophists wanted him to be overshadowed by the Christ impulse and the Buddhic impulse. Now, the word in overshadowed intrigues me. It seems to mean some kind of takeover of oneself. And I wonder if this is what Krishnamurti might have been struggling with, 
because then one is not working on oneself, one is working with another being. It seems quite ominous to me, because being overshadowed sounds like a darkening. Why must the world teacher be overshadowed by these two impulses, the Christ consciousness and the Maitreya, whom many of you know is the Buddha yet to come? In my own spiritual path research, it is something I've wondered for many years. Should one be overshadowed by these impulses, or should we be reaching up to the divine ourselves and finding the divine within ourselves as well? What I mean is, can we contact the masters ourselves? Can we find the God spark within us? Do we need to be overshadowed to contact the masters and feel the force? Is it the right thing to do to offer ourselves to other forces? I personally think no. We can offer ourselves to the divine, and hopefully he, was, he, she, it, will send down its divine hierarchy to help us. But what if it's not the divine that we're contacting, or the higher hierarchies, but the lower ones? What could this lead to? Can we trust in forces, or is this something we can transform within ourselves? And I personally think we should be transforming ourselves. This whole path of development should be an alchemical transformation. I've always been wary of the rituals that, or even wary, of the rituals that suggest invocation. How do we know what we are invoking is real and not the dark forces deceiving us? Should we be attaining to contact these other forces or should we be attempting to reach our higher selves? Which is something I believe Crowley and others were working at. Crowley might have contacted other forces but he was also very strongly advocating that we should be finding our higher selves, our higher guardian angel. Do we need teachers or enlightened masters to aid us? Well, Krishnamurti advises, There are two types of gurus, teachers or masters, those with whom the pupil is directly in contact on this plane of existence, and those with whom the pupil is supposed to be in contact indirectly. End quote. Now, I suppose it depends on what practice you do, and I'm going to use the word God in this, but what I mean by God is the divine source of all. I, I actually prefer the words divine source. And I suppose I should quickly explain that, to me, I don't put a gender on God or the divine source. He, she and it is what I use quite a lot. Now, Krishnamurti reminds us that truth is a pathless land, and I wonder if he means there are many ways to the truth, or does he mean one's own way is the only way to the truth? As I was saying earlier, we must blaze our own path on our spiritual development. We can learn from others. We must then use what we've researched, what we've discovered, the information, and go and experience it for ourselves. And that's something I do very strongly advise to people. Go and experience life, experience the spiritual within you, whether it's through meditations, when you are contacting other forces. Feel, if you're centered enough, you should be able to ascertain whether they're good or bad dark or light. I know many of us need guidance, we need role models, and there does seem to be many paths to choose from, which can be quite confusing, and there are many ways, or different ways, to help us in our soul and spiritual development, and I do think the soul development is the important thing. You know, we've got to save our souls, stay awake, don't be controlled. I think that if we are true to ourselves, then we are being true to the Divine Source. And it reminds me of Swami Vivekananda's speech about finding God, and the relevant words that he says, Swami Vivekananda says, find God, nothing else matters. And I've had many people poo-poo me for this, but I think that if you find God, then you become harmonized in your life. Other people have said to me, oh, other things are much more important and matter much more than finding God. But if you find God, if you're a believer, then your life will start falling into place, you will find a meaning. In the Gurdjieff work, George Gurdjieff reminds us that God gave us free will, but Gurdjieff also reminds us that God is within us all, and Gurdjieff believes it is our conscience, and I have done shows on this. Um, for those that are interested in looking into this more, if you look up some of my Gurdjieff shows, Gurdjieff talks about how conscience is there for in each of us, and not many people listen to it. It's up to the individual whether they want to listen to their conscience or not. 
but I believe that one has to be present to hear one's conscience. And which leads to me having to ask myself quite often, am I present? How can I affirm my presence? Usually we affirm our presence by being with others. So how can we affirm our own individual presence or even God's presence or the divine source's presence? Do I feel it? Do I sense it? Do I need to be overshadowed to feel the divine source? Surely I can reach up and sense the divine. If the divine is always there waiting for us to look up to make that connection, then it is down to us to make the move. We must develop ourselves to receive that Holy Spirit, the divine impulse, or whatever name you wish to give it. And I know many people are waiting for God to reach down to them. Well, God's given us free will. God's the divine source is busy doing his business or her business, its business. We need to reach up to the divine. The divine's always listening. We play many roles in our everyday life, the parent figure, the work personality, we've got our social life and such like, but to connect with the divine, with God, one has to be present. Do we need to be overshadowed to attain contact with Christ or the Buddha or any of the other masters? Or should we be finding the Christ impulse or the Buddhist spark within ourselves? You know, as some Paul wrote in the New Gospel in the New Testament, not I but Christ in me. The Christ spark is in us, the Christ impulse is in us, the Buddhist spark is within us, and we need to ignite it. We can all attain enlightenment if we can find and connect with it. Now Krishnamurti always helped people on their spiritual path, and there are many teachers out there for us to learn from. But he was telling us that we must make our own path to our truth, and that way we will find divine truth. Krishnamurti said, You want to know what is the right kind of ceremony you should perform, what gods you should worship, what prayers you should say, what kind of beliefs you should hold. With these things I have nothing whatever to do. We all want assurance that we are doing the right thing and sometimes we become too independent on teachers and guides. And Krishnamurti reminds us, You have become accustomed to being told how far you have advanced, what is your spiritual status, how childish, who but yourself can tell if you are beautiful or ugly within? I do believe there is hope for us all. If we really desire transformation, it is there for us to attain it. The age of Pisces is coming to an end, and the fish years brought us many teachers to learn from, Christ, Buddha and many more. The age of Aquarius is upon us, the age when we take the teachings from the last epoch and learn from them, imitate them, become like them. I'm going to end with a Krishnamurti quote. But those who really wish to desire, who are looking to find what is eternal, will walk together with a greater intensity, will be a danger to everything that is unessential, to unreality, to shadows. And they will concentrate. They will become the flame. Burn brightly, people.